let's start. So thank you for joining me today. I will be, this webinar will be, uh, will center on what we call the utility of the future. So that's um, basically talking about the, the seminal report that we released at the SDIA on um, digital infrastructure and how it, in many ways it's converging with electrical infrastructure and how eventually digital, digital infrastructure will develop. So we'll start with some, um, some, some house rules uh, to start with. So feel free to, to add um, questions to the Q&A and I will go through them at the end. Um, the format is approximately 20, 25 minute presentation and then another 20 minutes uh, of Q&A at the end that, that I'll answer live. Uh, you should have across your the bottom bar a Q&A button. <clears throat> so the agenda, so I'll briefly talk about the SDIA, who we are, what we're doing, and then I'll get into the, uh, into the meat. So it's the, the convergence of digital and electrical infrastructure, which uh, in many ways is, is the report that we released. I'll then also talk about the transformation of digital infrastructure. This, you might've been able to sort of guess, read between the lines in the report, but it's actually, I'll make it a lot more explicit. And then the last 20 minutes is Q and A. So the SDIA, what are we? We are a non-profit um, industry collaboration vehicle. Um, sustainability is obviously a, a system-wide uh, issue and the digital infrastructure environment is very siloed. So it is our mission to, to start to unsilo the different sectors, the different silos um, across uh, digital infrastructure. Um, and ultimately our goal is uh, a sustainable digital infrastructure by 2030. We're a member-based group. We have all sorts of members, energy players, um, technology providers, um, uh, even uh, local authorities and, and business agencies. Um, so we do really try and get everyone involved. Um, and we release quite a few public publications, uh, articles, podcasts. Uh, in addition to this, we also run a lot of research projects with national and, and European bodies. And the big exciting piece for us, the main collaborative tool is our roadmap, uh, roadmap to sustainable digital infrastructure by 2030. Uh, it's, uh, it will be released at the end of October at the Sustainable Places Conference. Um, that is, it's, this is just a little, a little snippet, it's, it's not done. Um, but that is our main collaborative tool. It, it basically takes a lot of the key elements um, that make up sustainability in this ecosystem and it, it tracks the, puts them on a roadmap and tracks them and allows people to collaborate uh, in one or, or many items on the roadmap. So that's about who we are. Now I'm going to talk about the reports. I'm going to basically recap on the convergence of digital and electrical infrastructure. So we know compute is exploding. The energy consumption of uh, computation in data centers hasn't actually taken off because of quite a few, you could say, um, energy uh, efficiency measures that, that uh, data centers have uh, undertaken over the last 10 years, in particular uh, virtualization, um, uh, improving the utilization rates and so on. So energy hasn't, hasn't spiked like that graph suggests it will over the next 10 years. Um, but it's uh, the computation and the sheer amount of data has exploded. We've just found better ways, more efficient ways of, of coping with it. So fundamentally, the key takeaway here is compute is really taking off. We contrast that now with another trend, which is the energy system. So the energy, as we move towards a more renewable world, renewable, renewable energy, uh, changes the energy system uh, in, a, in a not so subtle way. It, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine and that is not how our energy system has been created and uh, thus far. So that creates a certain number of, of changes in the system. Energy flexibility being uh, key to that. We need more energy flexibility to deal with the variability that renewables bring. As we tend towards 2050, most most governments have plans to be 80%, uh, say, renewable uh, by 2050. Um, they're not, many of them aren't <laughs> on track to meet that, 
but nonetheless it's still a, uh, an aspiration and where we likely see uh, regulation and whatnot heading so 80% by 2050 is, 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 uh, is, is a fundamentally different energy world. Um, you know, so you have on the one hand data centers being becoming increasingly large energy players and the energy world changing. Well, where's the synergy here? So the first uh, value proposition in the report and that in the report, it goes into it in more detail, uh, but it fundamentally data centers are becoming energy players and there's opportunity for them to, to involve themselves in energy markets. Uh, what do we call energy services? So it's not just energy flexibility. We know data centers have, uh, or certain workloads have an element of delay tolerance. Um, so load shifting in time or load migration across um, different areas of the grid to, to reduce stresses and, and, and help the energy system. That's one form uh, of energy service. But there are others, for example, fast frequency response. Um, so using the UPS systems and data centers to effectively help filter uh, the energy in the grid uh, to keep it at the right frequency. Um, fundamentally, data centers, we think there is, in, in certain cases, in certain energy environments, in certain data centers have uh, opportunities in that space. The next value propositions are heat recovery. So on the left, I know it's a bit blurry, on the left you see demand for heat in Europe and on the right where da data centers are typically located. Um, it's no coincidence. I mean, this is generally speaking, these are urban environments where heat is in most demand and urban environments where data centers are often located. Um, so heat recovery is a, is a, is a, is a topic that we talk about a lot. Um, fundamentally, people, the reason why it's not done is because uh, people often say that the business case simply isn't there. Uh, who pays for the extra pipe to connect the data center to the heat grid? Um, even if it's if it's connected and you, you come to some sort of arrangement, data centers still have to provision for a worst case scenario, which is that they can't deliver heat to the heat grid. Um, so they're not really saving on, on their capital expenditure. So there's all sorts of business model set issues. Another one is that heat is often not valorized. We can't, it's often difficult to put a value on heat. Yes and no, it, it's very much location dependent. Uh, and again, on the location synergies, we see a whole raft of coal power stations closing power stations are uh, in many ways some of the best environments to put put a data center they're physically defended they're often um, remote um, they have they often have a, a large area of space around them that allows campuses to form we know data centers like to especially hyperscalers like to form data campuses and this is a trend that we're seeing in america more than we're seeing here actually is old coal power stations disused power stations often urban power stations being retrofitted as data centers it hasn't actually really come to to Europe yet but uh, you know we see on the one hand coal power stations closing uh, they are typically um, located around the, these urban areas where we know there is compute demand and the last um, synergy or value proposition from the report is actually fundamentally the operation so Data centers are in many ways, mini power stations, huge amount of electrical mechanical work goes on outside of the IT. So leaving the IT alone, it is in many ways a power station. Um, both industries recruit from the same sort of roles. Um, they operate the same sort of roles. Um, so that personnel wise, it's very similar. Uh, operations wise are very similar. And in both industries, there is actually a shortage of personnel. Uh, we see on the right there um, a whole raft of experienced uh, data center personnel will be phasing out of the industry and retiring just as the industry uh, kicks into to fifth gear. So there are opportunities there um, to, to for, and I'll, I'll let uh, the readers decide what sort of opportunities there are, but uh, that's fundamentally, those are the fundamental uh, value propositions that we put in our report. Obviously, there are many more um between the, the convergence of these two industries uh it's four was enough in a 60 page report i didn't want to put too much <laughs> uh, it's enough to get through but um, there are many many uh, opportunities from this trend the report i, I, I rec recommend reading the report it goes into detail more on the justification and the, the explanations behind it and a lot of the trends behind it 
So now this is something that's quite new. This is uh, the transformation of digital infrastructure. Uh, I, I only touched on it briefly in the report. I didn't really go into detail, but uh, it is really quite interesting. How is the digital ecosystem, in particular the digital infrastructure ecosystem, how is it evolving? How is it maturing? Where will it go? Um, and in many ways, it mirrors how en the energy system developed. Um, so on the right, you see electrical power as really the, the, the critical utility of all utilities. It is so critical to society. It is, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really quite critical. And we believe digital power will in, in a decade or so occupy the same sort of position. Electrical and digital power will be twins. They will be the twin critical utilities. Why do I think that? Why can I apply? Um, why is electricity a model uh, for digital power? I, I, we coined the term digital power um, to, to just incorporate everything that involves compute and data. Um, or why, well, well first, I, I call it TIC, transience, instantaneousness, and criticality. So both electrical power and uh, digital power are transient. They are, you can't separate generation, distribution, consumption. They are, they require all that system all to be live all the time. Instantaneousness, they are in, in many ways consumed instantaneously. The electricity grid has to be balanced instantaneously um, and increasingly, um, especially with real time workloads, they must be consumed, uh, uh, computed instantaneously. And then criticality, uh, like I said, electrical power is very, very critical to society. Digital power, not so much yet, uh, but as um, applications, particularly ap applications uh, referring to sort of life critical applications come into play, then we think digital power will really be, will occupy that uh, critical cent central node uh, in the utility uh, uh, field. Um, by that, for example, you know, it, once we start producing life critical applications, so in many ways they're business critical and mission critical now, for example, an autonomous vehicle um, or uh, uh, robotics inside factories where, where actually if, if, if they're not live uh, and the com computation isn't being done, then, then it puts lives, lives at risk. Then we would say that's, that digital power is as critical as electrical power. So that's just the, on the reasoning behind why are they so similar, why are they so, so interesting and comparable. Now I'm going to talk about the phases of development in the industry. Um, they, both industries seem to go through these same sort of phases. The electrical industry, um, as I go through it side by side, electrical industry really on your left, digital on, on your right. Um, they started in a very distributed and fragmented way. Uh, you then get a couple of players leveraging economies of scale and other um, utilization optimization me measures, which separates them from the rest of the pack. They then consolidate the rest of the pack and they also find ways of um, introducing redundancy through the network. So zooming out from the, the data center and understanding the data, the, the system rather than the data center as, as, as the height of the asset. It's actually the system approach. Um, in many ways, the big power utilities are already there. Um, and in the data center environment, uh, there are a lot of data centers who are really at the first stage. They're still in a very distributed, fragmented stage. You then have a couple of the hyperscalers and, and some other players who are really advancing in this in this realm. So we'll take it stage by stage. <coughs> um, that graph, the, the photo on the left is uh, Chicago uh, at the turn of the 1900s. The, the key element there is the duplication of infrastructure. Everyone is trying to get involved in electricity. Uh, everyone's putting down their own generators, they're putting down their own cables, um, easy, easy money, lots of small players. Very similar to the data center environment, over 4,000 co-location data centers in the world, that's just, that's just colos, over 1,200 in Western Europe. Um, everyone knows someone who has, you know, one or two, co-location data centers and they're, and they're doing okay because the market's still growing, but they're bleeding um, share to some of the bigger guys. Economies of scale <clears throat> on the left um, is census data, electrical census data from 1907. And the key element there is it's what they call dynamos is essentially generators 
the number of generators didn't change. Uh, this is, in, uh, this is uh, data for America. The number of generators didn't change really between 1902 and 1907. In five years, the, the number of generators stayed pretty constant, about 12,000. But the output, said so towards the bottom of that picture on the right, the output of the stations in kilowatt hours more than doubled. So what you're leveraging is bigger generators, bigger dynamos. Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing that we're seeing in, in the data center world. Hyperscale data centers are leveraging economies of scale. And we've seen doubling in the number of hyperscale data centers over the last 10 years. <clears throat> Some of the more advanced players uh, are using utilization optimization measures. So what does that mean? Well, one of the most brilliant business model innovations was the ability to have sort of time sensitive pricing. So off peak and on peak. And what that did in the energy world is it allowed you to reduce the peak relative to the average and then therefore increase the average overall. So you increase the average utilization of your assets, which, uh, which obviously drives down costs. Um, the energy players, some of the more advanced ones started doing that in the uh, early 1900s. Um, and we see this is AWS on the right doing something very similar with the, using price signals to increase the utilization of their infrastructure. So they use three different types of product on demand, reserved and spot, um, all of which basically aim to just improve the utilization rates of hyperscalers. That's why you see them operating at near 60% utilization, whereas enterprise data centers are often only around 10%. Another very <clears throat> clever thing that you can do when you own the entirety of the, of, the, of the vertical chain is that you can create your own demand. So I think on the left, it was Edison General Electric. These were the, the energy uh, providers. And they also started coming up with their own electrical appliances. They were finding ways to load build to create demand for their own energy supply. And we see Google doing exactly the same thought, sort of thing, that Google own a lot of infrastructure, but Google also are creating a huge amount of digital applications um, that is driving demand for their, own, for their own infrastructure. In many ways, Google's kind of created its own little mini internet. <clears throat> and so lastly, what do you get when you have economies of scale, clever, business model innovations using uh, you know, improved utilization rates, you get consolidation. The big guy is literally started eating the smaller guys. See, um, in comparison, by the 1990s, that was down to just three mergers per year. In the data center world, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing more deals. Uh, and we're seeing bigger deals all the time, um, as, that, as that graph suggests. So we see consolidation happening in the data center world. Um, on the left, we see uh, redundancy through the network. So, so what does that mean? So in the early days, some of the energy guys started figuring out that actually we don't need to put more generators down. These are very expensive. We can just interconnect them better. Um, and that's how we can improve redundancy across the system. Um, uh, the energy grid in, in, the, in the UK is actually 12 regional grids. Um, and the UK Supply Act of 1926 created the national grid. So it interconnected 12 regional grids, uh, redundancy through the network. Now on the right, you see this is just Google's own submarine cables, for example. Uh, this is just Google alone. So there's obviously many more. Um, but they are finding ways to develop their network to the point where they're creating a huge amount of redundancy. <clears throat> so there we go. That, that's what's happened thus far. Um, you, you probably your next question is, okay, well, what happens next? <clears throat> um, and it's <clears throat> so again, I'll use energy as a, a the, the, the electricity system as a uh, blueprint for how the digital world might develop. Um, up until the 1930s, 1940s, there wasn't too much uh, regulation. And in the US, you then had started to get state and federal re regulation come in. They called it municipalization. Um, and there were a number of arguments in favor of regulating uh, big energy utilities. One was the destructive competition argument. So remember the, uh, the duplication of infrastructure and the, the private players are saying, look, if we're all competing, none of us can make any profit. This is unfair. 
let's get regulation in and have some sort of like franchise monopoly model. Um, another argument was we need to protect the consumer from natural monopolies. That one is actually probably quite applicable also in the digital, uh, in the data center world. And then another one is the public necessity criticality argument, which I think will, will become uh, more important in the data center world as uh, applications come out. But one of the biggest um, validations for that sort of argument was over COVID um, when we were, when the government was trying to work out who is a key worker and they released a list of who could still work and who should probably not work or work from home. And they included data centers on that list of, uh, of key workers. Um, so that's probably the first most obvious acknowledgement that actually data centers are moving in that critical direction. Um, how, how, do, how does that regulation uh, apply to the digital world where well, we see data privacy laws, we see data sovereignty laws, um, we see, we can also talk about um, protecting the consumer from, from, from natural monopolies. So there are some, some parallels there. What happens after regulation? Well, you normally end up with regulated monopolies um, and after a while, they're not that competitive. Uh, you then end up with what we had in the 90s, which was liberalization. So an, uh, uh, an element of deregulation or re-regulation, depending on how cynical you are, uh, and an unbundling of the system. So the, the unbundled generation and distribution and so on in the energy world, that's actually potentially very likely in the data center world as well. I can imagine them un unbundling software and infrastructure and forcing um, competition at each layer and not allowing uh, sort of privileged access between the layers. Um, by that, I mean Google, Google uh, software and, and the data must, it can't use Google's telecommunications uh, network in a privileged manner. They have to uh, purchase it as though they were separate companies. And that's something that happens in the energy world and it very much could happen in the data center world. And the last phase um, is potentially the creation of public marketplaces, cloud public marketplaces. So um, this is this again, it happened in the, the energy world. Uh, markets are, are generally regarded as the most efficient way of, uh, of, of matching supply and demand, of, of allocating resources. Um, and that could very much happen. I, I, I wouldn't know how to design that market. Obviously the energy market has to be balanced all the time and that dictates how the energy uh, system the energy market is, is designed data centers don't need balance so the market design might be very different so I'm not going to go into detail of, of how they might be designed but we do think that it's very likely that they will arrive before 2030 um, a decade in, in energy years is probably about two years in data center years so these things happen a lot quicker uh, in the data center world so that's a brief history and a potential view in into the future now I want to just dive into Google as a sort of a case study. Um, as, a, as a perfectly vertical industry, the, the, the graph on the left, the blue dots, they aren't data centers. They are <clears throat> what they call regions, like what I called earlier, sort of regional grids, uh, regional uh, digital power systems. Um, for example, the region, Frankfurt region, uh, will have multiple availability zones within it. Um, and that allows it to be um, really redundant, to take that redundancy to the next level, to an order of magnitude better than anyone else. So in, in the Frankfurt region, you have say Frankfurt one, Frankfurt two and Frankfurt three, three data centers. Um, and if any one <coughs> data center goes down, it doesn't matter the other two take up the slack. Um, they have that in Frankfurt, have it in London, they have that in 24 regions across the world. Um, and that will be extended to places like Poland, India, Chile, France, Spain, and so on in, in the near future. So what that really does is it doesn't necessarily improve speed or anything, but it, it improves redundancy. Um, and that, again, redundancy is needed for that critical applications. So you see a, us trending in that direction. What's interesting is that every big player is really doing it. So you're getting AWS, Google, Microsoft, they're all putting down their own digital grid irons. I use the term grid iron because the electrical world, you know, they had a national grid iron, uh, an electrical grid iron, and I think it's, it's very applicable to the digital world. But there's something potentially inefficient about every 
big cloud player and there are also smaller cloud players who are doing the same sort of thing using regions and availability zones um, this is a hell of a lot of redundant infrastructure right if everyone's putting down their own might it be better this is this is duplicated and potentially and expensive would it be better then um, consolidating that um, and that's obviously again we look at the um, any network good actually so the railway system in the UK the energy the electrical system in the UK we have a transmission system operator and a distribution system operator rather than um, everyone operating their own stock um, but so so, so an, an element of consolidation there's some regulation and you might end up with public marketplaces what we know is that they're already that some of the big cloud players are already operating their own internal private marketplaces like i said with the uh, the utilization opt uh, optimization through price signals their own redundant regional grids uh, the, <coughs> the submarine cables between regional grids you see that they're really building their own um private marketplaces public ones might be harmonized more towards uh, national jurisdiction and region um, so that that might be how it progresses so that's essentially it that's a summary so we saw from the report there are opportunities through the digital and electrical world converging waste heat recovery energy services location and operations based opportunities and then also using the energy industry as a blueprint for growth and a, a, a blueprint for the development of digital infrastructure it answers the question okay well, well how is it going to change where have we where have we come from where are we going how might that look um, that's uh, that's pretty much everything today I, I crammed a lot of content in there um, so please feel free to ask me some questions um, now we start the, the Q&A um, session Don't, don't have to be shy. Um, you know, please type the, uh, the questions on the, the question tool. Um, if it's a question I can't answer, I will, I will reach out to you directly um, uh, afterwards. Uh, and obviously this, um, uh, this webinar will go online as well for you to, to catch up on. I know I, I, I went through a lot of content in a short period of time. Okay, Ashley asks, based on a market approach, what are the first opportunities from a willing buyer, willing seller perspective? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, this is something that I don't necessarily, that it, it's hard to say. So what the opportunities from, or the value proposition for a, a seller might be improved utilization uh, of their, of their um, assets. And the value proposition from a, from a buyer's perspective is um, reduced cost. Uh, and it's also uh, also potentially more redundant, more, more available, so more redundant, um, and which is like I talked about, something that cloud play, players are doing, um, but that uh, we have that uptime, you know, 99.99%, 99.999%. .99%, um, but that often applies to data centers and what the cloud players have done is apply it <laughs> across the system um, they're producing system-wide uh, redundancy that's quite difficult to put a price on uh, but we know the price of downtime is very high so that's another element that we're looking at is how uh, how would a, a buyer win is reduced cost and improved redundancy um, there are obviously other market dynamics so uh, you know market share and losing out to some of the bigger players might play a role um, more from the based on the market not based on the raw value proposition uh, <clears throat> what do you think are the next steps to develop a marketplace well there are two there are two approaches right like like i said you need to sort of clarify the 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 the, the value proposition and then you actually need to be able to gather people to to deliver that um, there are there are some there have been some attempts to build marketplaces, um, but because it, it, it's quite hard because it's a, it's a value proposition that requires having both sides at the same time. 
uh, and that's very difficult and traditionally they've struggled to find demand um, so what are the next steps well it's probably I would say uh, finding a way to get demand uh, in the same room and, and, and asking them you know finding out what what they need why might they be willing to procure from a market why that would be better and how and in particular how that might be done so uh, you have one element which is defining market rules but you also have you'd have to have a, some sort of interoperable system um, in place so thank you max for that question anonymous attendee what can utilities do in order to be part of this transformation that i, I think you mean energy utilities there so it's interesting right uh, originally when we when we wrote this we thought energy utilities might actually become data center providers um, but there are several reasons why why they they can't do that they don't have the it competence um, they move just generally speaking they move way too slow um, but also a big one is that some of their biggest customers are the data centers so they would be creating a competitor out of one of their best customers so i don't think they in terms of their incentive i don't think they would want to do that but what they could do um, is uh, build the box and operate the box so everything except the it uh, you know the electrical infrastructure the power supply the uh, the backup um, all that sort of thing that's how they could make way for this we also see another way another approach and obviously that helps with them um, uh, waste heat capture heat recovery uh, on the back end um, what we also see is potentially them um, opening up their sites so having in many ways um, shared power station and digital power stations um, is something we call combined heat and compute um, but but also combined heat power compute um, because you know in many ways they are becoming critical assets so that that would there would be a consolidation of what's duplicated the electrical infrastructure physical security um, trying to find sites etc so that's um, that's how I could say uh, electric utilities could, could get in on it um, the report basically goes into a number of, of different approaches uh, for that thank you for the question Ashley Ballett Barrett, are the opportunities regionally, say in Europe, different from other regions, or is the opportunity universal? I think you're talking about the marketplace. Um, generally speaking, if, if I go to the opportunities in, in, the, in, the, in the report, uh, location-based um, you know, heat recovery, energy services, um, and operations-based, generally speaking, that's universal. Um, you know, like I said, we know that data centers, specifically co-location data centers, like to to congregate in urban areas. That's the same worldwide. Um, heat recovery. You know, is there a heat grid? Well, the, the heat grid question is, is is an interesting one because some areas uh, have better heat grids than others. So in the Nordics, that's particularly applicable. Um, heat grids. I'm not so sure about whether it works in Spain, uh, and I don't really know about the U.S. about whether they use heat grids. Um, so that really is, uh, that's maybe not so universal. That really depends on on the uh, district heating arrangement. Um, but location-wise, yeah, we do see a lot of, um, in particular, I would say in Europe, we're getting rid of our coal a lot quicker than the rest of the world. So that is a, a European um, opportunity to make use of those previously coal power sites. Um, what else is that location? And, and energy services as well that's probably more applicable in Europe because we have a higher penetration of renewables. Um, but that's not to say it's not applicable anywhere else. Um, so that, I hope that answers your question. Oh, I actually, and, and then to take the, maybe the other side, I wasn't quite sure if you were talking about the market opportunities. Um, that is also universal, but I do think they will be formed in, in regional clusters first um, before those markets might be the, the markets themselves might be interconnected. Uh, in many ways, that's what happened with our energy markets uh, in the beginning, in the 1990s. What impact do you think Brexit may have on this dynamic? Well, so there's two elements you might talk, you might say uh, that Brexit has. It's 
the regu regulatory side and then the demand side. And generally speaking, from a regulatory side, I don't see a massive change. GDP, you know, will will Britain take GDPR as its regulatory arrangement? Will Britain come up with its own and the EU and Britain mutually recognize each other's regulations? Um, those two, either, either of those two outcomes are the most probable outcome, in my opinion. The, the third one uh, is, is Britain become, comes up with its own uh, data, sovereignty data, privacy uh, law, equivalent to GDPR, um, that the EU rejects. But within GDPR, it gives you the right to recognize an industry or even a company. So even if the EU doesn't recognize Britain, it might still recognize um, a British car company or, or, or the British car industry, for example. So from a regulatory standpoint, I don't think um, Brexit will have too much of a, a difference. Now from a demand standpoint, so demand uh, in data centers, in, like I said, in those urban uh, environments, is demand is based on, uh, sorry, uh, data centers serve local demand. Now, the biggest ones being healthcare, uh, government ministries, financial services, and so on. So you would have to follow the demand. If the demand leaves, then you might have a, a, a flattening of uh, data center supply. Uh, in general, in, there's been no real evidence that there's a, there's a massive impact um, on demand. You know, I, the UK government is not going to shift its data centers to, to Holland. The, the major one might be financial services and whether they get their um, passporting rights. Um, but generally speaking, what it looks like is um, companies are moving their headquarters out of London. Some, some are moving it out of London to Europe, but the lion's share of trading will still take place in London. And the trading is what counts um, from the data center point of view. So generally speaking, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I don't think Brexit will play a major role. Um, and, and, and the, the, the figures suggest that over the last four years, it ha hasn't really been an impact on, on um, data center growth. So what can and should governments do, both national and or European level, to channel this development in the right direction, especially with regard to sustainability issues? Well, first answer, obviously, is to sign up to our roadmap. <laughs> um, but uh, of course, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, right? Because the danger when governments regulate is that um, we call it the laws of unintended consequences. And we actually were in the room with a load of regulators and a load of cloud providers. And they were asking, well, well should, should we put a PUE minimum on, on data centers? To, should we put some sort of performance minimum on, on data centers? And the, well, of course, all the cloud guys said, yes, of course, that's what we should do. Um, and of course, the cloud guys would say that because it benefits them because they have currently the best, best PUE. So, um, but the danger there is, you know, with what you've done with that regulation is potentially, if that was to go through, it would be to entrench uh, cloud providers' provision uh, position as even as even more of a monopoly or an oligopoly, um, and that's so. So regulation it always has a, it's a it's a fine line. Um, the first thing that we advocate for in our roadmap is transparency. So from a government po point of view, they might run a digital industry census, which might run every five years. So remember, I, I talked about the electrical industry census, and that just gives us data. It, it, it can be um, protected commercially, so it doesn't give away any commercial information, but, but it allows you know, the markets, regulators, researchers, everyone, to be honest. It allows them to see, okay, well, what is really, what is growing, what is changing, how our ownership um, you know, how, how are things really changing? And, and, that, and that's, you know, it gives us the information to, to regulate in the proper way. Otherwise, it's, it's blind regulation um, with the guidance of cloud players. <laughs> um, so that's one thing that governments could do. It's a digital census. Another one, from our point of view, is, is um, a number of, of uh, uh, what we call the digital carbon footprint and a digital resource footprint. So it's allowing us to track um, um, uh, environmental um, uh, uh, impact um, in a lot of what we do. Now, it's difficult because, like I said, the, the industry is siloed. Um, so, uh, how, you know, 
sometimes it's for a date for a co-location data center for example they're just saying well look we're just putting up the shell and what the, what our clients do with with their servers is, is what they do with their servers it's no, none of our business um so it's so it the, the roadmap allows everyone to start to input from their side in it in one um one collaborative tool and that's why i like the roadmap so much uh, but 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 fundamentally the first step is uh transparency um, if we can, if we can make the industry a bit more transparent, um, and that goes all the way down the supply chain, of course, um, then we can actually really start to target the areas that matter. Another thing I would say is, is it's important that we're not too hard on the industry. We're actually, as an industry, pretty good. Um, in the explosion of compute that we've seen, we've managed to keep energy consumption relatively flat, or only only slightly um, increasing over the last last 10 years basically virtualization uh, <coughs> is <coughs> virtualization and massive massive cloud data centers um, and that's uh, that's part of the reason why it's stayed largely flat so that's not um, it's important just to take stock of where we are it, it can always be better and that's what we're working for with the roadmap but uh, yeah so I hope that answers your question first and foremost is transparency <coughs> okay uh, any of the any more questions Okay, um, thank you all for joining me. Um, the webinar will, will be uh, will be um, available as well if you if you want to go through it. And I'm always available <coughs> to call or, or email. Um, this is uh, the road. Like I said, the, the roadmap uh, is really uh, something that the SDIA will be working on over the next six months, um, and I think it will be quite fantastic uh, for sustainability in our in our industry. Um, but always, as, as always, you know, with the analysis and the insight, uh, do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Do you have comments or did you find any interesting new information? By all means, please, uh, please, uh, please get in contact with me. So I'll, I'll stop the presentation there. Thank you very much for joining me.